Okay, good. Okay, thanks for coming. Uh, for those who are attending this lecture remotely, uh, you'll see a link at the bottom, a Q&A, where you can insert questions, and feel free to do that throughout the talk, uh, but we'll save questions uh, for the end. So, first of all, I'm Damien Roussan. I'm here co-hosting WG5, which is the international standards body for the Fortran programming language. And um, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, John Reed, who will be speaking today on uh, modern Fortran with an emphasis on co-arrays. To give you some background, uh, his first degree was in mathematics, and he developed research interests in numerical computation. He's published books on uh, direct methods for sparse matrices, and also uh, books on, on Fortran. Uh, his book was the first one, I think, Fortran that he explained. Maybe. And then uh, the standard has been updating every few years, so there was a Fortran 95 explained in 2003. Um, and then uh, I'm really glad to see them uh, change the name for the most recent one to Modern Fortran Explained, because I think that's actually largely responsible for popularizing the term Modern Fortran. Um, I like that term because it kind of shocks everybody into realizing that Fortran is a modern language now. <laughs> um, he spent five years as a lecturer at Sussex University in the UK, and then uh, worked in the numerical analysis group at Harwell, uh, which moved to Rutherford Lab in 1990. And it's a, he works in a group there that uh, produces uh, software in Fortran. And he's done a lot of work on the, on the committee, uh, joined the Fortran committee in 1981, served as the secretary for a while, and then was the convener of WG5, which is uh, the worldwide body uh, for, each, for developing the Fortran standard, and um, served as the convener from 1999 until uh, 2017. So with that, John? Okay, thank you, David. And thank you everyone for inviting me this afternoon. It's a, it's a pleasure to talk to you about Fortran. I always like to talk about Fortran because I've spent so much of my life working on it. Uh, this one. So I'm planning to give you an overview of Fortran 2008, which is the current standard. Um, and also to emphasize uh, the part of it um, that I find the most interesting, which is uh, its co raised and in particular, I'm going to t tell you something about what's in the new standard, which is about to be published, uh, where we began thinking about um, continuing to execute in the presence of failures. Because when you've got a million cores, uh, maybe it's unlikely any, each individual core is reliable, but when you've got a million of them, the probability of one failing during the course of a long run has got quite significant. So we've been thinking about how the code might continue in the presence of failures. And I found that fascinating and difficult, actually. I think everything to do with parallel programming is difficult, but that was particularly difficult. I'd like to just begin with a little bit about the history. Um, Fortran was released in 1957, so it's actually 60 years old, and there have been celebrations about its 60th uh, year recently. At the time, it was absolutely revolutionary because were then just using machine code and the idea of, of being able to, to use the machine itself to do the translation was revolutionary and it really saved, saved programmers a huge amount of time. Um, it was the first language ever to be standardized in 1966 and at that, that's the sort of time when I began working on uh, using Fortran and by keeping to 66 one could be sure that one's program was portable and would move any other, any other part of the world. Um, and it also became uh, widely available. If you wanted uh, your code to run somewhere else, you wrote in Fortran. So that was the, the very early history. What am I doing wrong? That's oh, this one. Um, what happened was um, the, the standard, what the the standard was revised in 1977, um, but it was rather conservative. The, the, the standard body um, wanted to, to get the thing done quickly, which is very familiar to me in, in what happens these days. So they decided not to do all the things they thought needed to be, to be doing, and they went, um, went for a conservative revision with the idea of getting a new standard out in 1982. Um, 
Unfortunately, that didn't work out. Uh, we were very, the, the committee was very split. Uh, some of the vendors were very reluctant to make changes because they had a huge investment in their existing compilers. And unfortunately, we got into a deadlock between those of, those of us, including me, who wanted to make revisions, bring the language up to date, and those who were uh, determined not to. Uh, there was even one case where one of the vendors came to the meeting with no, no Fortran documentation at all. All he came to the meeting with was documentation about the rules we were supposed to be following, and he tried to find some rules that we were breaking so he could claim the committee was in values and should stop working. Anyway, we had a long delay, and that's the moment, I think, when Fortran lost its popularity. And everyone's, a lot of people still think only of Fortran 77, but I'm sure you're convinced that that isn't the whole story. Uh, so we eventually got the new revision out. Um, we got past the deadlock. That was thanks to a special meeting in Paris where WG5, which is the international committee, uh, got everybody out of, out of uh, problems. It was a significant revision. Um, so the, the, the vendors who were worried about the amount of work they had to do, uh, in a sense, were justified. Um, so it had pointers, automatic arrays. The big thing about Fortran 77 is it had no dynamic memory at all. So that, that makes it um, very inflexible. So it had pointers, automatic arrays, allocatable arrays. It had array operations, quite a strong uh, array language, uh, parameterized intrinsic types, uh, derived data types, so you could define your own type and you could find operations on the types, internal and recursive procedures, uh, modules, lots of new intrinsic procedures, optional and keyword arguments, and new source form that wasn't geared to, um, to the old cards. So Fortran 90 really was a very different language from Fortran 77. Um, anyway, uh, implementations were slow to arrive. And so we were determined, the committee was determined um, for the next revision uh, to have a small change. So Fortran 95 was a small change. Uh, I've listed the things that were there, but they're all quite small changes, really. Pure procedures, element procedures, that's all to do with parallel programming. We were already thinking of parallel programming in 95. Um, pure procedures were in order that if you're executing in parallel, there were no side effects that would affect uh, you could, you could um, put, your, put a code out to another processor, no side effects, so it would just come back with its results. Elemental procedures were procedures that could impl implement on a large number of processors doing things in parallel. So like if you have an array and you want to take the signs of all the elements of the array, that's elemental. What you're doing on each element of the array is exactly the same thing, taking a sign value. Nested where construct, I won't talk about that very much. For all statement and construct, another, another form of parallelism. Uh, initialization of pointers and more about in specification expression. So that's when you're declaring an array or something. Use a more general expression. Um, we came up with Fortran 90 with the, op with the idea of obsolescence. Um, we had two stages. Um, outdated features were declared as obsolescent at one revision with the idea that they'd be deleted at a later revision. Um, so the idea was you get two notices. So a, a user who is using a feature would know that that feature would remain for the next revision but might be deleted in the one that followed. And this has just not worked because there is a huge demand for old codes to continue in execution. <laughs> Um, there is one exception, actually, which is carriage control has gone. There used to be um, a way of controlling line printers with the very first character of the output line, which said whether you fed on one line or put a whole page out, um, or even overwrite the, li over the line. So this, these line printers that go clonk, 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 clonk could, could be printed twice. We don't have those anymore, so that really has gone from the language. There were a few features deleted in 95, uh, for instance, non integer do indices, um, but they're still supported in compilers with uh, a warning. So I put this in red, upwards compatibility is taken very seriously. We're stuck with everything we have 
in the old language. The language is getting bigger and bigger and we can't do anything about it. I personally regret like that. I would like to be able to throw away some of the things that I don't like, but I can't. Um, moving on to 2003, having had a small revision in 95, uh, the committee thought, well, now we can do a big revision next time. Um, and so the floodgates cut, kind of opened. And I, I, by then, was convened. And it's actually one of my regrets for my time as convener that so much was put into Fortran 2003. Um, I'm not personally to blame. The whole committee is to blame. <laughs> <laughs> the job of convener is to reach consensus. And we had consensus for everything we put in. But it was a big change. And compilers have been very slow to catch up. Um, there were three things that we thought were so urgent in 95 that they couldn't really wait for the next revision. Um, and should go in a, a sort of mini standard called a technical report. The three things were more unallocatable arrays, uh, interoperability with C, and exception handling. Um, interoperability of C, we never quite agreed in time on exactly what should be there. The difficulty with that at that time was thinking about how limited a facility it should be, how far you should inter interoperate. So that was never produced as a technical report. Uh, the ones on allocatable components and dummy arguments was produced as a technical report, and for a long time, the kind of um, usual uh, implementation was Fortran 95 plus this extension on allocatable. Um, exception handling was something that I personally worked on, uh, so that was a technical report, um, and that came out as part of 2003, as did um, interoperability C, which was agreed by 2003. Object orientation was added. Um, asynchronous IO, that's something that's been in Fortran for a long time, so that was well overdue. Um, access to the computing environment, so you can find out what's on the command line. Um, parameterized derived types and derived type I.O. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, these things because these are really still an integral part of modern Fortran. Um, allocatables. Uh, when we were working with Fortran 90, um, the, pro the proposal for pointers um, tried to convince us that once we got pointers in the language, we didn't need allocatable arrays. Um, but the argument was made that all these uh, old-fashioned people who were using old Fortran would never understand pointers, never be able to use them successfully. And what was needed was um, memory that was, uh, was dynamic. So what we put in the language was simply, the, the simplest case of all, an allocatable array, so it could be allocated dynamically and used uh, once it had been allocated. <laughs> We didn't allow arrays to be passed down to a procedure. We didn't allow them as components of structures. Uh, but we came to realize that allocatable arrays are really very good news. Um, unlike pointers, they can't beat memory because an allocatable array only has one copy. It's either allocated or it's not allocated. It can't be undefined. It's either allocated or allocated. Once again, that's the same thing. It can't leak memory because um, an allocatable array ever only ever has one target. Uh, so they're much more easily controlled, much more reliable, and we came to think that we made a mistake in not um, putting more of them in. Uh, so that's part of Fortran 2003. And we also said that on return from a procedure, an allocated allocatable array that wasn't given the save attribute uh, would be automatically deallocated. So things were made easy for you. And also, if you do an array assignment for an allocatable array, and the allocatable array is the wrong size, it doesn't fail, it deallocates the old copy and makes a new copy of the right size. Very friendly uh, situation for you. So allocatable arrays were something we regarded as, as very desirable. Interoperability of a C, we did this in a fairly simple manner. Um, basically, we uh, required Things that could uh, exist in the two languages to be the two languages to be interoperable would be one too um, ambitious over what could be interoperated. interoperated. So the special requirements for types, variables, and procedures to, to say that they were interoperable, uh, and requirements on the syntax so the compiler knows how to 
whether an entity is entropic. We didn't do anything to the C standard. Uh, it was all to do with the way the Fortran standard could interact with C. Um, the one thing that was sort of new was we had to put something in for pointers. Uh, so there are two special types in Fortran to correspond with C function pointers and C object pointers. So that C pointer and C fun pointer were added uh, in order to inter interoperate with pointers. Um, exceptions, this is what I worked with. I tried, I tried to, to use a, a construct, so you had an exception handler uh, with, a, a, sorry, an exception, a, a construct with a handler, so you would execute your construct and if anything went wrong, you'd go into the handler and do something else. Uh, but that hit all sorts of problems. And so instead, what I uh, suggested was um, to provide intrinsics that supported the IEEE standard, hence got exceptions through uh, what the IEEE I standard offered. Um, so there's a module called IEEE exceptions, which supports exceptions. Um, IEEE arithmetic supports other uh, I IEEE features. And another module provide control over what's needed. So for example, you could say use intrinsic IEEE exceptions that say you're going to do some of this, uh, use I IEEE features only IEEE invalid flag, that would say for some reason you only want the invalid flag and you don't want other things. So it gave you some control over how much of IEEE you wanted. At that time, IEEE was quite controversial. Um, one of the problems was uh, other vendors who weren't offering IEEE features were very nervous about what was being offered. So this had to be optional um, and um, okay for those who had IEEE hardware, as well as those who did not. The situation has radically changed today. Almost everybody has IEEE hardware. Uh, this is the sort of thing you could have. You could inquire about the support of, of infinities and nans. You could inquire particular object was a NAN, uh, you could get, get or set the flags for the exceptions, uh, you could get or set the rounding mode. Parameterized drive types. Um, so uh, this is something that was quite controversial with um, the, the implementers because they found it quite hard to implement. Um, so I could define a new type, say matrix, um, which we have a kind, so that's to say, is it double position, is it single position? Um, we can have a shape, um, M by N. So we have two kinds of parameters, two sorts of parameters. The kind specifies the uh, hardware, and the, the length ones specify things like length. So here we have uh, a, matrix, um, a matrix type, uh, so the kind, could be single or double, uh, and the size is n by n. So it, it has two integers, which are its, uh, its sizes, and it has an array of size n by n. And here I'm declaring um, an object A of, of this uh, new derived type. It seemed to us at the time to be fairly simple when we were designing the language, but it's hard for implementers to do it. Uh, one of them described the length um, parameters as unkind. <laughs> <laughs> object orientation. Uh, I've brought up on procedures, so I, I don't find object orientation um, very natural. Um, but that's just something that a lot of people like, and it was felt essential if Fortran was to be modern that it included uh, object orientation. Uh, so the most simple thing is you can have procedure pointers. So pointers were only objects in Fortran 90 and 95, but they now become uh, procedures as well. So here I'm, declaring, I'm declaring um, a procedure pointer. It has an interface as, a, as the procedure proc. So it, so it has the same interface as that. So it can point to any procedure that has the same interface. So that's the same um, kind of arguments and the same number of arguments, the same kind. Um, um, it's initially null, it's initially null, so it points to null. Um, and if there's nothing you can point to to specify the interface, uh, you can declare an abstract interface. 
but that de declares um, what, what the arguments are and things like that without declaring an actual procedure. Uh, you can have procedure, oh, I've done that. Um, you can bind a procedure to a type. So this means the procedures will always be available whenever the type is available. So here I've written up uh, some examples uh, where um, I've got two procedures, prop one and prop two, um, uh, both of which are associated with my proc. So they're both associated with, um, with a, a given procedure. I've got a generic here. So this is uh, proc uh, is associated with these two. So it's a real proc and an int proc. So that means that we choose which of those two is, is appropriate for extras or reals. Uh, you can have a generic that is associated with an operator. So that will be called if they want to do addition. Uh, you've got an operator there, there are, there are two plus one and plus two according to what the types are of, of the things you're um, adding. So here's an example, I've declared uh, A, B, and C of type T. Uh, I've called 8% proc. So that passes to the procedure. Uh, the object itself, A, it passes X and Y, the arguments. Um, and here's an example of using um, a, a plus. So now I've said C equals A plus B, and that will automatically call whichever is appropriate of plus one and plus two. Type extension, uh, given a type, uh, you can extend it. So here's an example of taking my matrix type, which I had on a previous slide, and extending it. Um, I work with sparse matrices a lot, so I think of matrices and their factorizations. So here's an example where um, I might have uh, a matrix and also its factorization. I want, I want to extend the type to include its factorization as well. So I've got another uh, array as part of the type. It's going to have the same kind as, as its parent does. So I've declared it as real matrix kind. So that's real, single or double according to the kind of, of the original matrix. And the fact is it's just a new, a new array of this size. Uh, so all the type parameters, components, and the bound procedures of the parent type are inherited by the extended type and known by the same names. Polymorphism, uh, you can have polymorphism. So you, you declare an object as, uh, instead of by, by uh, type, you declare it by class. That means that when, when you come to use that object, it may have the type it's been declared with or any extension of it. Um, so if it's polymorphic, it must be a dummy argument that's been passed in through a procedure, or it's allocatable, or it's a pointer. Um, to make use of it, uh, there's a select type construct. So here I'm um, taking a polymorphic object F, and it, it might be its its type is sorry its class is matrix. So it might be uh, an ordinary matrix. So I can say select type F, type is matrix, then I can have code for the case where it's just a matrix and doesn't use the extensions. Type is factorized matrix. Now we have statements that uh, allow for the, 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 um, the um, extra the extension that I put in for the uh, factorized form. So this allows the compiler at compile time to be able to compile code for this because when, when it's compiling this code, it knows it's only a class, not a type, but it, it will know about this uh, factored matrix type. So it can compile code in there to, to be appropriate. Sorry, I'm not sure if questions are appropriate. But, um, well, I was curious, is the factored matrix, is there a, is there a subclass superclass relationship here, or are they different, class, different parallel classes or um, objects in this? Uh, we only have one level of, of um, inheritance. So you can, you can, so you can have several levels. <laughs> right. Once so you've extended the type, you can extend it again. Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think so. Okay. But there's no sort of bifurcation. Right. Okay. Um, drive type input output. Uh, in Fortran 90, we were allowed to uh, extend plus to new types, uh, but there was nothing to do with um, I/O. It was a natural extension. You've got 
formats for integers and for reals, etc. You really want a format also for variety of types. Um, I don't want to go into the detail, but I thought I'd just show you an example here. Um, I've got a type person, and I want to write out some data about it. And so I've got a format where I'm writing this object chairman, and I'm writing an integer, uh, two integers, and here, corresponding to chairman, I've got this derived type uh, format, DT 15.6. And what that does under the covers is um, make sure that you have a call of a procedure that the user has written, uh, which will be sent uh, the object chairman, and it will be sent these values 15 and 6. And that, that procedure will then have to uh, take that data and produce the, the, the relevant output. And this is not the thing that the vendors disliked, it's a lot of work to do it. Uh, I have, I just give you a simple example for the sake of speed. Um, there's more to it than this, but um, there was another, another reason why uh, the standard got delayed actually was because of this. The situation for support of 2003, when I came to write this slide, I was very pleased because I found that there are actually uh, two more vendors now fully support Fortran 2003. It's very sad that we're now in 2018 and we're talking about uh, support for 2003. 2003 is actually the date at which the features were agreed. It's not the date when the standard was finally published. So it's not quite as many years as it looks, but it's still an awful lot. Anyway, there is now full support for Fortran 2003 by ARM, Cray, Fujitsu, G Fortran, IBM, Intel, NAG, uh, NEC, and PGI. That's quite a nice long list of vendors. Um, the two new ones that I've just added are Fujitsu and NEC. So what seems to be happening is Fortran is particularly being uh, found to be useful on supercomputers. Um, uh, several of the others are not, oh, ARM is also for um, supercomputers. Um, the IBM compiler, the Intel compiler, the NAG compiler, uh, those are all appropriate for a desktop. Um, there's a near full uh, implementation by Oracle. It's just missing drive type IO and associate construct. I haven't told you about associate construct. And there's a partial support by AppSoft. Um, Fortran Forum, uh, each, almost every issue, issues um, a table of what's been implemented by each of the compilers. Or you can Google Fortran Plus. If you Google Plus, you'll, you'll see a table of what's uh, implemented. So what's, what's in Fortran 2018? Uh, sorry, what's in 2008? Car were the biggest edition by far. Having had a, a large edition of Fortran 2008, sorry, Fortran 2003 was a large edition, uh, we were determined as a committee to make the next revision small. Um, so that was our intention. Um, however, uh, parallel programming had come up, come to its, um, come to fall by then, and we felt it was very important to include something on parallel programming uh, or more on parallel programming in the language than was there. So, Kerberos, that was by far the biggest addition. Um, it was quite controversial, um, and in the end, compromise was reached. So uh, what was put in for curl rays was not as much as some of us would, would have liked. It was more than some of us, some others of us uh, wanted. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was still a, a big part of Fortran 2008. Um, Submodules was another technical report of something else that we thought was very important, which was introduced before 2008. Um, Submodules were introduced with the idea that sometimes you had a very large program with a huge module with a million lines of code or something. And if one line of that needed to be changed, uh, the whole thing had to be recompiled, which might take hours. So the idea of submodules was to sub subdivide things into parts that were more manageable. Uh, we also had some performance enhancements, do concurrent and contiguous attribute with both things to um, enable more 
and more execution speed of simple uh, constructs. Uh, the block construct allows local evaluations of objects, gives more intrinsics, and internal procedures were allowed as an actual argument. Something I've always wanted as a, as a writer of library code, something I always wanted in order to be able to uh, pass a procedure. So you pass a procedure to us, uh, but for us as a library and writer in a convenient way. Lots of little things. Uh, well, I thought this afternoon I'd mostly do was talk about color rate. Um, so here's a quick summary of what color rate look, looked like. It's a uh, single program, multiple data. So uh, the idea is the program is replicated a certain number of times. And we talk about images because that's replication of the program. And normally this will be the dot o file that's actually replicated. So exactly the same program is sent to each image. An image it may be a core, maybe a node. It's useful, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, the number of images is fixed during execution. Uh, each image has its own set of variables. So it's just an ordinary piece of Fortran code, really. It has its own set of variables, but some of those variables are special, like co-arrays, which may be addressed from other images. So you can read or write to or from them for another image. The images mostly execute asynchronously. It's left to the users to put in code for synchronization. The synchronization statement, sync all is the easiest and simplest one. It just synchronizes all the images. Uh, you can sync images, which means you sync a specified set of images. The lock and lock, um, lock and unlock uh, feature, critical construct where you you execute one piece of code. A piece of code is executed only on one image at a time. Um, and allocated and deallocated, I'm going to talk a bit more about that in a moment. And there are intrinsics for finding out which image you are, finding out how many images, images there are, and for finding out the particular image index you've got. So here's a, some examples of what Carl syntax looks like. So here I've prepared uh, two scalar curl arrays. Uh, I've got these square brackets and um, uh, stars. So R is a scalar, so every image has an R. Uh, but it's a curl array, so it can be addressed from another image. Um, the code is compiled regardless of the number of images it runs upon. So you can develop and compile a code for a small computer and runs on a much bigger one. So uh, we use the star as for our assumed size arrays. Uh, so it's an unknown size at compile time because it might be, uh, you don't have any images you're going to be. You can declare the lower bound other than zero, other than one if you want to. By default it's one. So here I've got S with a lower bound, a lower code bound of one. Um, here's um, an array car array. So it's an array of size N on each image. Uh, here I've got the derived type. Um, arrays always have a assuming cosine equal to the images. Um, here I've got some local variables which are not currently, so they can only be addressed on the local image. Here's a few examples of the syntax. Uh, here I've written the scalar x on image P uh, and copy a particular um, S to the local T. If there's no square brackets, it's a local variable. Here I'm taking a section, so I'm taking a section from uh, the HP and copying it to the local, uh, the local section. <coughs> and here I'm doing the opposite, I'm taking my section on, on, the, on the current image and copying it to image P. And here's a more complicated <coughs> example where I'm taking um, a two-dimensional array, taking a particular element of that, uh, which has an array component and copying it to the corresponding array component on another image, uh, indexed by P and Q. Most of the time, you don't want more than one uh, co index, in my experience anyway, but you are allowed to have more. <coughs> the total number of uh, indices and co indices is limited to 15. Uh, so each image normally resides on one core, but several <coughs> images may share a core.
for, uh, e.g. for debugging, so it's like NPI in that respect. Uh, or one image might execute on a cluster and um, perhaps be working with OpenMP. Uh, one principle we kept to all the time is the concept known as symmetric memory, which is that a co-array has the same set of bounds on all images. So the compiler arrange that occupies the same set of addresses within each image. That means that one image can calculate the address that a particular part of a co-array will have on another image. Uh, and that means that there is less traffic because you don't have to have a double reference. Um, the, the, the local um, implementation can calculate the address and, and uh, get, get the object from the remote the remote thing. You haven't got to go to the remote object, um, get down an address, and then work from that. So symmetric memory is one of the principles we've kept to all the time. Uh, synchronization, the sync is the simplest thing. Sync images, if you declare an image set, that's just a set of, um, of indices of, of um, images. <coughs> And there's the critical construct, uh, which is a block, the critical and critical, and uh, only one of the only one uh, image can execute that at once. Uh, dynamic arrays, uh, the only um, dynamic arrays, the only form is the allocatable array. If I declare um, an allocatable co array, um, so here I declare one with A with one local variable and one co-array, one co-dimension, and S is a scalar uh, with uh, two co-dimensions. And now we have allocate statement here. Uh, that has to be executed on all the, all the images with the same sizes. Uh, that's so that uh, the memory can be kept consistent. Um, by, by having exactly the same size on all the images, the model is that each image will use a stack in, in the correspond, have a corresponding position in the stack. So every array will have the same address on every image. That requires synchronization because you can't allow uh, one image to do its allocation in a different order from another image. It has to be synchronized. So there's automatic synchronization as an allocate, and also as a deallocate when you un unwind the stack. Uh, so they can all perform their deallocations and deallocations in the same order and keep symmetric connection memory. Uh, dummy arrays can be car arrays. Uh, they can be of explicit shape, assume size, assume shape, or allocate a baller. Um, but there are rules to ensure that you never get a copy in, copy out. Um, this is something that Scalar, uh, the non co array Fortran, sometimes has. Uh, sometimes, if there's incompatibility, uh, there may be a copying going on. But that's not going to work for co array uh, because you'd need to copy on all the images. That's not really going to work. Uh, components of the structure can be co arrays. Um, which provides a powerful mechanism for the case where you really want uh, different images to have different sizes of objects. Uh, so you can declare uh, a derived type to have an allocatable component, and that component is allowed to have different sizes on different images. So you get away then from the rather strict rules that allocatables have. Uh, pointers are required to stay pointed to their own, within their own images. Um, so we don't allow pointers to another image. Um, and we don't allow allocation on another image either. The general idea is that each image is responsible for its own work. It, it, it isn't responsible for work on behalf of anybody else. It just does its own thing. It can access data from another image. It can place data on another image. Uh, but it can't tell the other image to do something. That would be a much more difficult thing to uh, organize. Um, Submodules, I mentioned briefly, that was part of a, a technical report. A huge module can be split into several submodules um, to avoid a compilation cascade 
when um, a large, uh, a huge program, a huge module needs to be recompiled. The idea is that some modules can contain the definitions of the procedures, and the module itself contains the interface stuff. So all the stuff that you need when you use a module uh, is available in the module itself, and just the procedures are in sub-modules. So if you want to change something about the way the parts of the program communicate with each other, okay, you've got to do a recompilation. But if it's just one of the module procedures that you want to change, then you can do that without problems. Uh, I looked uh, just to see what the Fortran 2008 supporting compilers uh, now looks like. It's not so good as um, 2003. Uh, full support is provided by Cray. Uh, current rates are supported by Intel, by G Fortran, and Fujitsu provide near full support. I'm not quite clear what they don't supply, uh, but they are quite near. Um, there's significant support for other features, um, G Fortran, IBM, Intel, and NAG. That, that's not going to be in order, that's just alphabetical order. Again, the details you can see that in Fortran Forum. So the situation for full support of 2008 is not so good, sorry to say. Um, it's getting better. We're hopeful that soon there will be, there will be more. So if I move on to the latest standard, uh, we decided just last year that we'd use the year when the standard was published for uh, the name of the language rather than the year in which we chose the features. So Fortran 2018 is formerly known as 2015 because we did choose all the features then. Um, and we're on, we, we've been working this week on it and it all looks fine. Um, we've been making quite a lot of detailed changes, but they are very small detailed changes. So I think we're on schedule for publication towards the end of this year. It really will be Fortran 2018. It was intended to be a small provision. Uh, given the problems we were having with a slow implementation of, 2000, of Fortran 2003 and 2008. Uh, the main features are more probability with C um, and further CoA features. Further interoperability with C, the main problem with what we have in 2008 is that you can't, um, you can't uh, interoperate with Assume shape, allocatable pointers, or optional arguments. Well, assume shape arguments, allocatable arrays, pointers, or optional arguments. And the way Fortran 2000 fills this gap is by defining, defining a descriptor in a standard way. Um, so when, when uh, you want to pass an allocatable array to C, say, from Fortran, uh, the Fortran compiler will, will generate a descriptor for the C to look at. And on the C side, uh, there's a function uh, that, that is provided which will let you look inside the descriptor and find out everything about it. So you can find its address and its size and everything else you need to know. Um, the actual definition is, is in a, um, a .h file. Standardized .h file. Well, the .h file will vary from vendor to vendor, but your use of it will be perfectly portable. And Fortran 2008 also allows C functions to accept arguments of any rank or any type. So the sort of things you're sometimes doing in uh, passing objects to C, uh, you want work to be done that isn't dependent on the rank and isn't dependent upon the type. Uh, teams, um, this is now thinking about, um, this is now kind of a current extension. Uh, the fact is, when you've got this huge number of processes, you're likely to want to subdivide the problem into parts. So we've uh, defined teams um, for independent execution on subsets of images. And the general idea is you might uh, develop a code uh, on the whole, the whole set of images, um, and you want it to run, say you develop an ocean code, you want it to run in the ocean part of a big model, and you have another code that you develop for the atmosphere part of a big model. Now you want to move the two together. So you can have a 
big program uh, that works on both the ocean and the atmosphere models and the interaction between the two. Uh, separate teams, the image teams, the image team, the index of the in image will be relative to the team. Uh, not, so you don't have to so the all the internal work is done for the compiler. Um, and the collective, uh, the collective activities like single locations uh, will be uh, done relative to the team. Um, for the team is done by um, sub, the form of team by subdividing what you have at the moment into parts. And you do that by having an integer for each of the parts. So you want to divide the team into just two current team into just two. Uh, one part will be part one and the other part will be part two. And you execute a full team statement um, and on the image you say if you're going to be team one or team two with the number. So this is the argument here of form T. So images in the same value of number will form a new team. And all the images have to, have to synchronize at a form team statement because that's where you're arranging things. And then you have a construct for the change team. So we have a change team construct and then ended by the end team. What happens inside here is you're executing as a team instead of executing uh, where you were uh, outside the team. So this block is executed as a team. And now, just as you need to query which image you are when you're working with ordinary car array code, now you need to know which team you're in. There's a new intrinsic uh, team number. This is the number you used when you set up the teams. Uh, so here, we've got two, I assume we've got two teams. So if team number one, then, um, then you have code for team number one, else you have code for team number two. Uh, next, the the um, images synchronize as a new team at the beginning and the end of the change team statement. Um, this, uh, this statement here allows you to um, associate uh, with Coarray, which is Coarray here is um, a Coarray that exists in the, in the parent team. Uh, now you have a new a new way to index it within the child team. Um, so there's an association going on, and, and that same regardless of how the co-indexing went in Coray, is now going to be co-indexed as a, with a single um, co-subject. That allows the co-rank and co-balance co to change. And basically, you need to do this because you have a huge, you may have a huge uh, rectangle, and you are dividing it up into parts. And the numbers that you use to refer to the rows and columns of the big thing are not, are not nice when you're working with the little things. You want an, a new set of indices to work with the subparts. Uh, you can access a simple with a, a new syntax. So um, here I've uh, formed a team and changed it. And now I want to do, I want to access some data on one of the other teams. Uh, so we've, we've added extra syntax in the square brackets. So what I'm accessing here is image me plus one in the team initial, um, which we set up here. Uh, so this was the initial team this was the team that's really the parent team. So that's allowing me to address uh, the team that we had before we went into the change team um, in a simple way. But I'm trying to say it for situations where you want the new indexing and situations when you want the old indexing. Uh, found images, I mentioned that briefly in my introduction. Um, <coughs> First of all, uh, you can make an inquiry about whether there are any failed images. Uh, the new intrinsic uh, failed images returns an integer array holding the image indices of failed images in the current team. 
So if, you if this comes back to the zero sized array, uh, there's no failure in the current T. Uh, you could also you could also inquire about a, a, a particular team. Um, so you can return an integer array holding image image indices in, uh, of another team if you want to inquire about that. So that's the inquiry. Um, you can test for fact this actually is uh, an image control statement. An image control is a synchronization statement of any sort. Um, so here I have, for instance, a sync all. Um, I should be using this. To do this. Uh, here I have a sync all. Um, I have a stat equals st. So that is inquiring about whether anything has gone wrong in this sync all statement. If one of the images of the team has failed, uh, then you'll need to do something else. So you can do a test if st equals stat fail image, um, then in some way deal with the failure. And the model we have is um, that if you get a failure, execution will continue. It's rather IEEE like. If anything's gone wrong, you don't stop. You continue executing. And it will be up to the programmer to somehow uh, uh, arrange that there be some point in the computation where there's data that can be. Uh, return to and be done. Um, so that's the way code has to be written to deal with the failure. But it isn't anything automatic. We're not trying to um, make things be automatic. We're just trying to allow the programmer to provide code that is robust enough to deal with, with failures. And repeat computation with a different set of images is what we would normally expect to happen. Uh, you also need to be able to test uh, with a remote uh, access. If you've, if you've um, accessed, accessed uh, some data on a particular image, you can again uh, add a stat equals into the access uh, statement. So that, if, if that comes back with a, a stat equals failed image, uh, that tells you that the image you've tried to reference is no longer working. So again, you've got a way of dealing with the failure. Uh, we have collectives. Um, we had a big list at one time, but we cut it back. Um, so we've got co-broadcast, co 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 co-max, co-min, co-sum, and co-reduce. And co-min and co-min are pretty obvious. Co-broadcast is pretty obvious. Co-sum is. Co-reduce is um, for doing a collective of um, any operation yourself uh, want. So you, um, it's like co max and co min for another function that you can pass in. Uh, so at one time we had a big list and then we decided that if we just did co reduce, we covered everything with one cloth. Um, and they basically involve some synchronization inside, but not necessarily when you actually call them. <coughs> the, main, the, the main argument is not required to be a co array. It um, will have to do with some uh, exchange of data inside, of course, um, but it's not required to be a co array. Um, I'd like to put up a slide on the advantages. Um, one is that references to local data are obvious. Because uh, you don't need to use the co-subscripts if you're referencing local data. You only use co-subscripts when you're accessing the work data. Um, it's easier to maintain code, more concise than MPI, and it's easier to see what's happening. Um, it's integrated with Fortran, and it has things like type checking, type conversion on assignment, and so on. And it provides optimized communication. Uh, local optimizations are still available. Uh, so, for instance, if you reference a remote object with square brackets, uh, the compiler can hold those temporarily in registers, not even in, in its own memory, hold things in registers until you get to a synchronization statement. At that point, it's got to download it so that other images can access that data. Um, 
but it doesn't make it severe to one with all the compiler persistence. So conclusions. Um, I wanted to make the point that Fortran is still alive. Fortran is not Fortran 77. Um, Fortran, I, I like to think of Fortran 2008 as modern Fortran. Um, and it includes car A, it's a nice way to do parallel programming. Um, Fortran 2008 is under construction and includes uh, a process for recovering. <coughs> And very importantly, all the old code continues to work. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, maybe we can take some questions from the room first, and then we can also check the Q&A uh, for any remote questions. I um, wanted to add one thing that I, sh I should have uh, included in the, int in the introduction, which is that John uh, was the co-inventor of the Coray features. Uh, so he's been very influential on that part of the language and influential on my own work as well. I lead the development of the parallel runtime library that supports uh, Cori Fortran. So I wasn't really the co-inventor, that was Bob Newry. Okay, I guess I've always heard your name associated with his as the co-inventor. Uh, Bob, Bob is the ideas person, I'm the detailed person. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I work through the details. <laughs> so we had, we had a very nice collaboration. Okay. Um, and one other note on the compilers list, uh, Intel is now Fortran 2008 compliant, as well as Cray, so there are two compilers. And, um, and Intel, Cray, and GNU also all support some Fortran 2018. Uh, in fact, uh, with G Fortran, which with, with I'm most, most associated with, um, all of the features that uh, John talked about today have at least some partial support uh, in G Fortran, uh, including the, all the Fortran 2018 features that were mentioned. So, uh, any questions from the room? Let's see, and do we have any remote questions? Okay, well, um, I'll toss one out then, since I, I guess you uh, worked on at least the details of it. I'm curious, uh, you know, this was certainly before, I think there was much work on parallel programming languages and uh, everybody was, I guess who was doing parallel programming was writing MPI, and so I'm wondering what was, uh, the inspiration uh, and, and what you're going for with the development of Cori Fortran and in your work with Bob uh, in, in terms of uh, what you had to look at to you know, compete with or respond to or where you were trying to take. Well, if you just look at, the, if you look at a Curve program and you look at an MPI program, it's so much easier to see what's going on with a, a Curve program than with an MPI program. Bob also, uh, believes that car rates should be implemented more efficiently than MPI. But there has been such a big investment in MPI, and I don't think that's really worked out. Uh, I think you go for car rates uh, because it's easier to write, easier to understand what you've written, easier to maintain. Don't think you go for car rates for performance versus MPI. Oh, sorry. All right. That is strictly speaking true. Practice, most codes I have seen use point to point or two sided MPI communications, whereas with uh, core arrays, it is if your compiler uh, has implemented it right, uh, you get the benefits of using one sided MPI communications. And in that sense, uh, you might even get some performance advantage. Because as we most people in this room probably know that uh, one-sided one -sided MPI is somewhat more difficult to write than uh, two-sided MPI. That's my comment. <coughs> uh, yeah, so with failed image, has there been like, tests on large systems to see how all problems actually work? No, I don't think so. Well, you haven't done any tests. It's language, have you? No, but the the feature you mentioned, that's a failed statement, which uh, as a programmer you can put in your code that says, make it look like the image that executed the statement has failed, so that your pro so you can test your recovery mechanism without sending somebody downstairs to pull it. Bad <laughs> 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 people come and take you away. Uh, I think that's that was actually a very clever. I think I'll try to get it. 
I, I couldn't put everything in that. We've got a huge language now, trying to cover everything in an hour as possible. I had to be fairly. <laughs> Causes no failures, and um, typically it's more than ninety percent of the time it's a from memory problem. It's because there are lots more memory chips in the system than there are, and so and they have like one a day or something. But you know, you can scale up to a much larger machine. Uh, if you have a memory quality, you're likely to lose all of the images that are executing on that memory. So, in fact, it's probably not going to be as That's outside of what's going to be said. So, I'll toss one more in. Um, I wonder if you could talk some about your work in applications with color arrays. And also, uh, I have the sense that John is very modest and not wanting to oversell uh, things too much. But uh, my impression is that in some of the things that you've worked on, you've actually seen some speed up in some cases with switching from MPI to color arrays. But I know you've done some work with uh, PDE solvers and also, I think, FFTs to, uh, applying color arrays. Co so can you talk about that experience? Um, uh, well, yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> Um, I've done a limited number of trials of the one against the other. Okay. And that was what I was trying to express, that uh, the speedups have not been significant against mm. NPI. Okay. Um, what has been significant is the clarity of seeing, okay. seeing the code and maintaining it. I think that's the big advantage. Good question. I have a question. It's not about something you're talking about today, but, but I'll ask it anyway, just because it's about some more, more modern, sort of modern constructs. Um, it's about assumed shape arrays. Yeah. So I'm, I'm uh, reading Portland Best Practices on one of the online web pages. And from time to time, I've kind of experimented with, with using assumed shape arrays as opposed to not uh, using a other possibilities. Uh, do, do, like, is that something that is now widely used by practitioners of modern Fortran? Uh, should we oh, have absolutely, to? Yes. absolutely. There is there is a danger that the assumed size, so I assume shape array, is not contiguous in memory because you can pass an array section that is contiguous. Mm -hmm. so you can pass all the even number elements of an array, for instance. Mm -hmm. But one of the changes that we put in recently was the contiguous attribute. Uh, so if, if continu contiguity is important to you, uh, you can have an assumed shape array with a contiguous attribute. And then the Fortran compiler will check whether it is contiguous or not. If, if it's contiguous, there's nothing more for it to do. If it isn't contiguous, it will make a copy and what is that copy? Um, so that kind of solves the performance problem that was there. Mm -hmm. I've, I've recently begun using them a lot, and I, I like the fact that it makes my argument list more compact. Usually. Absolutely, yes. Uh, yeah, but, but I still have colleagues that, that are... Uh, if Put the contiguous attribute in, or if it's not supported on the compiler you're working, then it has to do more work all the time because it has to allow for both cases. It's not much more work, but it does, it will impact the performance of some doodles from them. Okay, let's thank the speaker. All right.